So I want to get into uh, what pro-child politics means to you and what these policies would be and how we as a country adopt this. So get ready to present this to us in actionable form, things that we can do, positions we can vote for, and even if you have a mind to do this, uh, people for whom we can vote. Katie Faust is with me. She's a three-time author. There's a link to the latest book. You can get that in the show notes. And when we do programs like this, I try to come in as alert as I possibly can. Yep, there's the caffeine from our coffee sponsor, Bone Frog. There's sleep, there's exercise. There's also the bioptimizers. And I use magnesium breakthrough to help me sleep through the night. It also controls stress. Magnesium drives or regulates 600 body interactions, including the stress hormone cortisol. This helps with regularity. But the magic of it to me is I relax. I feel warm. I take a breath and I sleep. Magnesium Breakthrough is the only magnesium supplement that has seven forms of magnesium, all natural, all organic, not the fake synthetic magnesium you get at any of the China Marts. And this is the only place you can get this for free. Not at Amazon, not at the Bioptimizer's website, and they're running out of free bottles. Wouldn't that surprise you? Hey, you can't give stuff away for free forever. Go to megbreakthrough.com slash Todd free. That's megbreakthrough.com slash Todd free. They will send you a free bottle of magnesium breakthrough. Here's my ask. Get back in touch with us. Tell us how it worked for you. Megbreakthrough.com slash Todd free. So Katie Faust, what make up a uh, pro child politics? How do we take action on this? And um, you know, what can we go do? We took 19 of the most evergreen political issues, the things that are always going to come up at every single election. And we said, if we frame this in terms of what was best for children, what would policy look like? And so we've got all the social issues. We've got the economic issues. We even got the national security people to come in here. You've got the three different legs of the conservative stool represented here. And we brought them all together because when you actually craft policy based on the next generation, you get principled conservatism. So the book sort of functions as a primer, like 3,000 words on ESG. If you don't know what that is and how to think about it, here's 3,000 words from Justin Danoff, who helped Vivek Ramaswamy start his company Strive, telling you, this is, this is what ESG is. This is how it damages kids. This is actually what we would look like if we wanted to create an equ equitable and just and sustainable society for kids, right? I mean, so you've got this in essence, political lesson on all these different topics from the top experts, but they all frame them through the lens of if we prioritized kids, what would our policies look like? But they also all begin with the real life story of a child who was victimized because we believed leftist lies. And so this book does what very few other conservative materials do, which is identify the victim as kids and then humanize the child. I mean, we've always had the best statistics and the best research the left does a good job of humanizing their victims and making you empathize and sympathize with them. So I'm not going to let them do that anymore. I love we are that. going to show the real life stories of kids who were victimized because we got immigration policy wrong, because we got foreign policy wrong, because we got education wrong, because we got masculinity wrong, we got race wrong. Like what is it? Like when we believe leftist lies about pornography, we're going to show you the kids that are victimized, their mind, body, soul, heart, future, lost because we are not thinking rightly about these issues. So that's what it is. It's a way to think properly about politics, all political issues, if you're looking at it through the lens of child protection. And child protection started with a family. The first yeah. one started in yeah. Genesis. And so we also have this model, and I know you to be a godly woman, and it, this model has to, of course, take God's word into this. So let me take a tough one. Okay, because I think the pornography on, on this podcast family, this radio show family, they know that I looked at my last porn decades ago, and I'll never look at it again, praise God. And they know my position on this. I, I think Pornhub is a criminal enterprise that should, that should be just, it should be uh, recoed out of business. I, I think that they encourage uh, child, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, but let's take just national security. That's an interesting one because I'm thinking about this. If I were looking at national security through a child's eyes, how might I look at that, Katie? Well, Dan Caldwell, who is a veteran in this space, wrote our 3,000 words on right. national security, and he identifies. So what I made every author do is begin with the story of a real-life child who was okay. victimized, and then identify what are the lies about national security that you hear all the time. And then how do those lies harm kids? So what are some of the lies that Dan pointed out? Well, first, that we have to be the world's policemen. 
right? And like, what is it like when we think, oh, we've got to go out and solve every single problem. We have to like build every school in Afghanistan. Like, how does that mentality around national security victimize kids? So that's one lie that he points out. Another lie is we need to be total isolationists. We should never engage in what's happening in the rest of the world. And then he identifies that kind of faulty mentality and how that victimizes kids. And both of them really weaken our ability to defend ourselves against the very serious foreign threats that are not just present, but growing against us. And then he identifies what is the truth about foreign policy that you need to keep in mind. And in summary, he says, realism and restraint. Be realistic about the threats coming against America and have restraint so that you can fight the battles that you really need to very, very well. And if we did that, how would children benefit? What would child protection look like if we actually did that national security uh, priority exactly as it should be done? And then I made every author wrap up their chapter with, show me who's done this well. Where, what bodies, local, foreign, national, what have they done to show how these policies implemented actually are effective? And so he lists some ways that we could overhaul our national security system and rubric to move in a direction where the next generation is going to be better protected. So we did that on every subject. It is so easy to digest and understand, and you are getting high quality content from people that know these subjects inside and out. Give me your favorite story. You're a great storyteller. I've seen you online um, have people who grew up with a single parents or same sex attracted parents. And, and I've, you've solicited from them their stories and it's been very, very persuasive. So if you're to pick one from a book or one that can really just bring this across, share with us one. I made all of the authors find a real life child who was harmed because we got this wrong. I had a lot to learn about a lot of these topics. One of them was ESG and DEI. And so Justin Danoff started off with the story of a little girl in Sri Lanka who went from a pretty stable middle-class family to virtually starving because the ESG and DEI regimes were imposed upon Sri Lanka in the name of, you know, saving the planet. And it actually resulted in starvation and death for children. And so it's stories like that, you know, where you humanize and you show yeah. the drastic decline in well-being of real life children, because we are pushing something that, like we talked about earlier, sound fantastic in ideology land. But when you actually implement it in the real world, kids suffer. Can any of this be done fruitfully without it being biblically based? Well, you can make arguments based on God's world, right? So that would be natural law, social science, obviously the real life stories of kids. But anything that is true that you can verify, quantify is always going to be reflect. Anything true in the world will always be fortified and buttressed by the word of God, right? What is in the word of God is always going to completely complement the world of God. And so we tactically at them before us, my nonprofit, we make the decision to argue based on God's world. What can we learn about how children ought to live, what they need, how they come to be, to what they have a right by appealing to God's world, right? That universal uh, authority to which everybody must submit. And it always reinforces and complements God's word, which is my ultimate authority. Tactically, we're like, you don't need to appeal to Genesis 1-1 to make this case. We will show you the authority of God as manifest in the world that you can touch and taste and verify yourself. Okay, that's a really interesting approach. So um, there's that very famous saying, sometimes, I, I don't even know if they really know who said it, but that phrase, uh, share the gospel with everyone you meet and, so, and, and when necessary, use words. Sometimes yeah, people think, say it was Spurgeon. Do you know who actually said it? I think it was St. Francis of Assisi. So, okay, St. Fra Francis of Assisi would make sense. So your tactical decision is then, I guess, not to be uh, ov overtly Christian or to come straight out with the Word of God, the Bible, um, but to show truth that will always go back to God because God is truth. And the tactical decision is an open door. It's a big tent. What What is it? Is it, is it the best way to protect kids is to, I guess, gently suggest God? Mm. Well, I think that it is to fervently argue on their behalf in ways that are irrefutable and undeniable. That's what I'm after. And unfortunately, I think that Christians did not do the hard work of making their case in a way that the world could understand and instead fell back on just quoting scripture. And I, I say just quoting scripture because I love the word of God. I mean, like I'm in it 
I try to read the Bible with everyone that I'm with. But when it comes to communicating policy objectives, unfortunately, that can serve to discredit us in their mind rather than bring doing it's harder. It's harder to understand the historical, anthropological, social science, uh, psychological aspects of this and then bring to them a case that perfectly represents the word of God, but does it in a way where they're they're not able to dismiss us because we are only quoting an authority that they don't recognize. So tactically, I, I totally get that. And I think it's a very smart tactic. One of my views uh, and this, I don't know that I have any, um, I, I don't know that biblical support for this, but I don't know that I don't. Um, it seems to me that we serve a God who's very, very happy to say, well, it looks like you guys got that all handled. Looks, looks like you don't need me. Have fun. Um, or to say to us, oh, you want a king? Oh, oh well, I think that's a bad idea because they're going to tax you and they're going to trans your kids <laughs> and they're going to steal your parental rights. But okay, go have a king and go experience that. I happen to think that a tactical use of the word of God in these environments and, you know, oh my gosh, even in Congress or the Senate, my belief is that God's word never returns void. And my sense is that if God started seeing his words spoken into some of these things, he might say, oh, okay, oh, wait, did you want me to help? Because I'm getting the sense you might want my help now. Because he seems fine to let us use our own devices. So what's your view of that that uh, that dynamic? I agree that, um, well, I totally understand where you're coming from. And yeah. I will say that, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time over the last day or two talking with an Orthodox Jew, uh, Orthodox Jewish rabbi who is working to fight against the um, the creep of reproductive technologies into the world of Orthodox Judaism. Oh, and wow. for him, I'm saying what you need to do is you need to rely on the 39 scriptural principles in the Old Testament that explicitly talk about your obligation to defend the fatherless. That's the authority that your audience is going to hear. And so what you have to do is you have to make the case, and he is ready and willing and excited to do this. I'm not telling him something he doesn't know, um, that actually when you endorse things like IVF, surrogacy, sperm and egg donation, you're not defending the fatherless, you're manufacturing the fatherless. Oh, and so you so do good. have to figure out, you know, what are the pressure points for each culture? And what's the biblical precedent for this? I would say it's Paul at Mars Hill, right? When Paul goes and he speaks to the Jews, he'll quote scripture. But when he's going to speak to, you know, the the philosophers and the Stoics, he appeals to philosophy, right? He appeals to the Aristotelian principles that they spend hours and hours and hours debating. It's really all Christians saying, like, you want to be all things to all people? Then you have to study those people and you have to figure out what are the areas that resonate with them. And then you bring the truth to, of God into that situation. And I would say that's especially pressing for Christians if you are fighting on behalf of the vulnerable and victimized, right? I it is a bit of throwing pearls before swine if you're just like Bible verse here, Bible verse there. No, you want to throw something at them that they can't help but eat up. And then you say, and now I'm going to tell you exactly why. I love it. I love it. So well said. Such an honor to have you on the program. So I'm proud of you and so thankful for what you do and always a thrill to see you continue to succeed. There's a link to the book in the show notes. Katie Faust, I always appreciate you. Please go with God's good grace.